another place. Come with me, let's have a smoke break. And it's just an off break. There were plenty of years where there were guys who would dread being drafted by the Buffalo Bills. Not anymore. Astronauts report it feels good. Two minutes, 25 seconds. Brandon Bean realizes they're in a window of two to three years max to get this done while the iron's still hot. And getting Von Miller into that situation was big for the Bills. Ten, nine. Oh, ho, ho, baby. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. here with you live on the buffalo fanatics youtube channel on a thursday night and that of course can only mean one thing it is the smoke break powered by bet us where the game begins receive a 125 percent sign up bonus in the link in the description below on your first three deposits up to 2500 using the promo code join 125 we are two short weeks away from the first round of the 2024 nfl draft in fact two weeks from just about the second me rico pierre whoever else we usually have a whole crew we will be live together on a massive panel for the entirety of round one of the draft. And I absolutely cannot wait. We look forward to having you join us. And we look forward to seeing what Brandon B is going to do in round one. I've been saying for a long time that I think that this might be the most important draft of Brandon Bean's career. And I was saying that before the Buffalo Bills moved on from Stephon Diggs. It's more than doubled, I'd say, my my thought process on that since that move. If it was big before the moving on from Stefan Diggs, how much bigger is it now? Absolutely massive. A very pivotal draft for the Buffalo Bills as we move into the next chapter of the Josh Allen era with no wide receiver one, with a very young still to prove himself wide receiver two, Big need at safety, big need on the defensive line uh, depth, big need maybe on the offensive line depth area. Nothing as big, of course, as the wide receiver locker room. Uh, and, And that's where we all are anticipating that these Buffalo Bills go. But where will they go and get it done? Will it be in the first round? Will they trade up in the first round to get that guy? Will they trade back into the second round? Maybe even the third round, double dip. Or will they just stay put at 28? So many questions to be answered, and they will be answered two weeks from tonight. The other possibility, do the Buffalo Bills make a trade before now and the draft or the day of for a veteran player? T. Higgins out there, you know my thoughts on that. No way I could imagine the Cincinnati Bengals sending him to Buffalo, but never would have thought the Buffalo Bills are moving off of Stephon Diggs this year, so I am done with certainties. Brandon Ayuk seems to be probably the most likely name to be moved on draft day if a receiver were to be moved in a massive trade. That could be 
something the Buffalo Bills look at. But what they have to look at in general is the wide receiver position. Ever since Stephon Diggs has been moved off from, it's been about a week or so now and a long week at that. It still does not seem to end the constant chatter about Stephon Diggs, the constant chatter about his departure. And of course, his Twitter account, it seems to just be a never ending cycle of conversation surrounding Stephon Diggs. Um, But with his departure now, it leaves a massive hole in an area that already felt like it was a massive hole. Cat's pretty much out of the bag at this point. Everybody knows what the Buffalo Bills have to do. But it's just a matter of how they're going to do it. I don't think I've ever been more nervous than I am right now going into the draft. Drafts prior, of course, you were excited. What are the Bills going to do? How are they going to add to this already great roster, great team, Super Bowl competing type roster? How are they going to add to it? I don't feel that way this year. My feeling is, how are they going to set themselves up to continue to be that team in the foreseeable future here? It's quickly, you know, it's amazing how quick things change. You're no longer in a position of luxury where you can add guys to help contribute early on and then hopefully take over the reins down the line. You need guys that not only can contribute immediately, but frankly, take over immediately and then hopefully continue to build on that as time goes on. The wide receiver position, no matter who they take in this draft, no matter where they take them, whether they go all the way up towards the top 10, stay at 28, move up maybe to the late teens, early 20s, move back, no matter who they take, that guy is going to be a starter week one. No matter how good he is, how bad he is, that guy is going to be a starter for the Buffalo Bills catching footballs from Josh Allen on day one. Not only that, he's going to be looked at as the success, successor to Stephon Diggs. Whoever comes in for these Buffalo Bills at wide receiver has a lot of pressure on him. Now, the pressure is alleviated knowing Josh Allen's the guy throwing you the ball. These top wide receivers who end up getting drafted in the top 10, they don't have that luxury. The reason these teams are picking in the top 10 is because they're not good enough to be picking later on in the draft. And that usually means the quarterback talent is pretty average. I'd say if the LA Chargers end up going wide receiver, I don't think they will at five. Doesn't seem like a Harbaugh type move to me, especially in his first year. But say they do, that would be the wide receiver who lucks out the most in the top 10. But you think about the others. Obviously, we don't know what Caleb Caleb Williams is going to be if the Bears end up going wide receiver again in the top 10. Going to have to play with a rookie. You know, we don't know what the the Cardinals are going to end up turning out into throughout the next stages of Kyler Murray's era in Arizona. They've been towards the bottom of the league for a while now. Could be a potential suitor for a wide receiver there. A lot of these teams who are drafting wide receivers early on are in a spot where the receiver is completely relying on a quarterback that isn't in that echelon that Josh Allen is. And we've seen repetitively, it wasn't just a one-off on a guy or two. We've seen time and time again, when a receiver is added to this roster, Josh Allen maximizes on their potential. Cole Beasley, John Brown, Stephon Diggs. That's why I'm so excited for Curtis Samuel, a guy who's played with bottom barrel quarterbacks his whole career. I can't help but think that being put with Josh Allen will give him maybe the best year of his career upcoming here. But it's certainly not going to be enough to carry the weight of this Buffalo Bills offense, at least to the expectations that we have set for ourselves over the time in which Josh Allen has been the quarterback. So with that said, whoever does get drafted for these Bills, yes, the pressure is alleviated because you're playing with Josh Allen and you are set up for success. But that doesn't take away the pressure that will be put on that player as far as the assumption that this guy is going to be the face of the wide receiver locker room for at the very least the next four or five years. And if he's anything, you know, if he's good enough to earn that vote of confidence, you'd imagine he'd be around longer. That's what the Bills are facing two weeks from now. It's not just a guy you bring in and, uh, you know, we hope it pans out. This guy needs to pan out. And that's where my anxiousness stems from. 
especially depending on how the Buffalo Bills go about it. I mean, imagine they trade all the way up, like some are speculating. We'll talk about that in a second. To the ninth pick with the Chicago Bears or around that area. Imagine they do that and whoever they end up taking, Sammy Watkins type situation, right? Imagine. That could significantly hinder the future of these Buffalo Bills for quite some time. Imagine they don't make a move up. And all of these wide receivers in the top of this draft end up being as good as we're being told that they are. You're going to live with nonstop regret. You had the replacement right there. Who cares what you had to have given up? You should have given it up. You should have went and made the move. It seemed inevitable that the 2024 wide receiver draft class was loaded. Why didn't you take advantage of it? So much at play here. Brandon Bean has got to get it right. And he's got several options, as I listed off earlier. He can trade up. He can stay put. He can move back. He can go and get a veteran. He's got four choices, but to me, it only comes down to those four choices and those four choices alone. I cannot for the life of me fathom a situation where Brandon Bean does not walk away with the first pick that they have in this draft with a wide receiver. I think it would be malpractice in regard to the current roster and the way that it's set up. I think it would be grounds for borderline mutiny from this fan base. I can't even imagine. Can you imagine the backlash that will occur instantaneously if whoever walks out to make that pick, probably Roger Goodell, night one, whoever walks out to make that pick for these Buffalo Bills says a name of any player outside of the wide receiver position. I think that's what it's come down to. But even with the knowledge that it's very likely going to be that positional group, there's still so much at play here. Now, luckily, there are a ton of options for these Bills this year. I can't imagine a better year to be in the position the Bills are in. If you ever had a year where you were legitimately without a wide receiver one or bona fide wide receiver two, we still, listen, I love Khalil Shakir, and I love how he looked towards the end of the year. I'm not ready to sit here and say, yep, that's my wide receiver two for the future, guaranteed. Certainly could develop into it, and we've seen strides towards that. And if it continues, I think he certainly will earn that role. But we don't know, and we can't sit back and depend on the, the fact that that might pan out. So I can't think of a better year to be in a position where you're without a bona fide wide receiver one and a wide receiver two. Because they're touting this upcoming draft is perhaps one of the best all time when it comes to the receiver position. And that's not just at the top even though the top is incredibly good. This is as good of a wide receiver draft class at the top as I've seen. Neighbors, Odunze, and Marvin Harrison, any other year, if they were in individual drafts, say Harrison came out this year, Neighbors next year, Odunze the year after, guaranteed they'd be the first wide receiver off the board in each of those drafts. Just so happens that all three are in one draft and all three will very likely be going within the top 10. So you have those options. But as you go down the board, there's still plenty of guys out there with incredible upside. As it stands right now, it's projected to, uh, it's projected to currently have six to seven wide receivers go in the first round. That's the current markup or makeup. That's the projection. That's nearly, what, a quarter of the entire first round dedicated to that position? That's for a couple of reasons. One, it's about as good as it gets in terms of the position. Like I keep saying, this year is generational for that spot, and because of that, teams are going to be exhausting their resources towards those guys. But not only that, we're seeing the wide receiver position. It's kind of, a, it's kind of odd where the wide receiver position currently is. It's, it's seem, seeming to toe a line between the running back position and the quarterback position. If you're at the top end, the top, top end, I'm talking Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. I mean, these guys are, we're talking quarterback type money here. I cannot wait to see what either the Vikings or whoever they decide to send them to, and I think they'd be nuts to send them anywhere. But regardless, I'm dying to see the number that Justin Jefferson gets. 
it, it, it's going to be earth shattering. Jamar Chase probably going to be right around that number, I would imagine. But once you start to move off of those top three to five guys, the problem is, is that a lot of those guys that are outside of that window view themselves as if they are in that window. I think Brandon Ayuk might be in that position. I think T. Higgins is in that position. I don't think T. Higgins is quite understanding of what the current spot he's in is. Jamar Chase is unpaid and will undoubtedly get a max contract or damn near close to whatever Justin Jefferson ends up getting, depending on who signs first. And he's expecting the Bengals to somehow find enough money in the bank to pay him top of the market type money as well. At the same time, there's not a chance. Problem is he's not a Jamar Chase. I love Brandon Ayuk. I'd love to have him on the Bills tomorrow, and he would be a great wide receiver one for the Bills, but I don't think he's a Justin Jefferson type wide receiver, nor do I think he deserves to be paid as one. So a lot of these teams are looking at the position and saying, we can either pay a guy that we don't view to be top five, top five money, or we can just go back to the draft. And this is exactly what happened at the running back position. Are we going to draft a guy in round one at the running back position? Knowing the injury history, knowing the longevity, or are we going to sign a free agent running back to a massive deal? Or are we just going to go second round, third round, fourth round, and we're just going to keep rotating through it because it's seemingly working year after year. Obviously, you have your outlier. Saquon Barkley just gets a huge deal with the Eagles. A lot of running backs ended up signing in this free agency period. It was kind of refreshing because there had been a massive lull at the position. It was almost a resurgence of the running back position in this offseason. But there were also a ton of big names. Some of the best running backs in the league were up for contracts or up for free agency. And that's why you saw moves being made and money being dealt out. But the wide receiver position is in a weird space right now. But luckily for the entirety of the NFL, the position has never been better coming out of college. You got guys like Puka Nakua coming out on, on day three and taking over the league, setting every rookie record you could possibly imagine. You have guys time and time again, year after year, coming in later rounds, making massive impacts. But we all know that the game plan can't be going into the draft banking on Puka Nakua in the third round, saving your wide receiver room. You have got to be aggressive to make sure you get the guy that has the best chance to do that. The Rams got lucky. They'd never tell you that. So many of these teams end up getting lucky. The Bills aren't in a position to test their luck. They have got to go and make their own luck in this upcoming draft. And that, to me, is what makes this one of the more intriguing drafts for the Buffalo Bills in recent memory. And certainly, one of the most pivotal. So as I keep saying, so many questions at hand. To me, there are pretty much four major questions. Will, will Brandon Bean stay put at 28? Will Brandon Bean make a trade up? Now, there's a 1A and 1B to that. Will he trade all the way up? And we're talking big balls, Bean. Big baller, Bean. Major franchise-altering move. Go to the top 10. Does he do something similar to what we saw with Dalton Kincaid last year? Move up just a little bit to make sure the guy that's there stays there and we get him. Move up medium level type move up, right? Mid-teens, late teens. Does he move back? Let's start there because this is the first I've, I've heard, and obviously moving back is always on the table, and it's stuff that has been tossed around. But this is the most prominent, I would say the most prominent, um, example of talks being circulated on the idea of Brandon Bean moving back to get uh, to get a wide receiver or God knows what. I mean, I keep referring to the first pick as if it's guaranteed to be a wide receiver just because I can't fathom it not being, but you really have no idea. Jordan Reed of ESPN comes out today. This is uh, something that sort of made some waves on Buffalo Bills Twitter today. Jordan Reed, courtesy of ESPN comes out today talking about the possibility of Brandon Bean moving down in the draft two weeks from tonight and not moving up like you're starting to hear a ton about. You can go anywhere right now and find someone talking about moving up. This is one of a few, if, if not less than that, examples of the Bills moving down. Here's what Jordan Reed had to say. Even before the Diggs trade, there has been some expectation that the Bills will be aggressive in trying to move up 
for a ride receiver on day one. But I'm actually hearing the opposite. The Bills might ultimately be content with letting the draft play out and addressing the position at number 28 or even possibly trading back. If things go that way, Keon Coleman of Florida State and Xavier Leggett of South Carolina are worth watching. Buffalo lacks a true boundary X receiver, and both would provide value in that role as strong physical pass catchers. So to summarize what we're hearing here from Jordan Reed, what he's hearing. Now, let's keep a couple of things in mind here. One, anything you hear this time of year should be taking taken with a bolder sized grain of salt because it is smoke screen central at this time of year. Everything being put out right now has some angle to it, no matter what. Either someone's trying to raise someone's draft stock, someone's trying to raise their own value in regard to their current draft position, Someone's trying to make it seem like they're not going to move up, not going to move back, not going to stay put. Everything's got an angle to it right now. So keep that in mind. Very well could be an angle to this. Someone within the Bills front office might want it to be uh, put out there that, hey, I know it seems like we're desperate to move up and get a wide receiver, but eh, not so fast. We're fine where we're at. We're just hanging. Maybe move back. We'll see how it is. We're just going to kick our feet up night one. We'll take it. We'll take it as it comes. Right. But it could also be being put out there because Jordan Reed has some real solid intel on the situation. Ask yourself this right now. You let me know in the chat. How would you feel if we get to like pick, let's say pick 17? And the Buffalo Bills have made no moves. At this point, you are well aware that the Bills have not gone up and gotten that franchise guy. And at this point, the most you can move up 10 or less spots. But you're starting to notice that that's becoming increasingly less likely. I mean, let's just say, let's let's go past 17 because it could still be likely they move up. Let's just say we're getting to pick 25, 26. It's becoming inevitable that the Bills are going to be either staying where they're at or moving back, not going to be treading up. How would you feel? Where would you be at with it? I've been asking myself that question all day long. We do this a lot. We build ourselves up when it comes to the draft. We build ourselves up a lot when it comes to the NFL. We build ourselves up on expectations for the season. We build ourselves up on the highs and lows of each and every game. But the draft is where we really build ourselves up into thinking one thing or another and then sticking to it, kind of marrying it. And I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty much married right now to the idea that the Buffalo Bills are taking a wide receiver. And not only that, but I've pretty much come to terms in my mind that in order to do that, the Buffalo Bills are going to be trading up to do it. Now, when you say trading up, I think a lot of people hear that and they say, oh, you mean the Bills are going to go all the way up and do it? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying trade up in general, whether that means going from 28 to 20 or whether that means going all the way up to six through nine, somewhere around there. I just feel like it's way too pivotal of a draft for Brandon Bean. It's way too pivotal for the future of this offense to be complacent, to be willing to let things fall where they fall. Now, look, at I'm not a GM. And there's good reason for that. Brandon Bean is, and there's good reason for that. He knows what he's doing, and I trust him wholeheartedly. But the way I see it, it would be tough to sell me on the idea that the Bills can sit on their hands in this draft, let it fall the way it falls, take what comes to them, and that's going to be the answer. 
I almost think that there's something to be said about moving up because it tells you the Bills see their guy, that guy, as their guy, as the person that's going to be the one that fills the shoes of Stephon Diggs. If you stay put or trade back, that tells me a couple things. Either one, the Bills could just be fine with what's there. They looked at the draft board. They didn't feel as though it was worth going all the way up, and they find a lot of value at where they're at or later on should they trade back. That could be a possibility. The other one could be, look, we didn't, we didn't have the resources to trade up. We didn't have the trade partner to match with us, to allow us to trade up. We don't love the value in uh, either the current spot or later on. And we just kind of have to take what comes to us, what's here, because we are in a position where we have no other choice. To me, it kind of reads more like that than anything else. If you stay where you're at, it kind of reads like that to me. Trading up emphasizes the clear situation the Bills are in. You trade up, you're pu- you, you are putting the exclamation point on the idea that the Bills have got to go and secure the person that they feel is obviously the best choice for leading the resurgence of this offense in the upcoming seasons here. Doesn't mean you got to go all in. Doesn't mean you got to give up an insane amount of draft capital to go all the way up. But You know, it does mean you have got to put your money where your mouth is and have a guy in mind that you can clearly tell is going to be a significant help, not only now, but certainly down the line as well. And it's April 11th. We're two weeks from night one. Brandon Bean's got that guy in mind already or a couple of guys in mind already. Maybe that guy is, uh, you know, A.D. Mitchell or Lad McConkey, and they're able to stay at 28. And maybe it winds up working out. Or maybe it ends up being one of these top guys and Brandon Bean goes all in. But you know for a fact that as we sit here right now, there's there's guys in mind. And Brandon Bean's strategy is more or less mapped out. It's outlined at the very least. And if you had a gun to my head and you made me bet on it, I'm telling you, I just think that the moving up situation makes the most sense for a multitude of reasons. The higher you go up, the better talent that's seemingly there. Now, we we don't know that. It's going to take time for that to pan out. But as it stands right now, the higher you go up the draft board, the better talent there is at the position. That's just obvious. But it also secures you not getting leaped over by another team like the Chiefs did not all that long ago, leaping over the Bills, drafting McDuffie. Bills get stuck with Elam, and look how that's worked out. McDuffie's an all-pro. Kyrie Elam's barely seen the field. You trade up, you avoid that. You avoid potentially the talent gap widening ending up with a guy that's not going to be the answer. There's just so many reasons to me for the Buffalo Bills to make a move upward. And I can't help but think that they don't. But Jordan Reed here, based on what he's hearing, is suggesting that that might not be the case. If I were to make a read on this particular take from Jordan Reed, I can't help but think that based on everything that we know about the Buffalo Bills as it stands right now, I can't help but think that this was put out there to basically go against the inevitable. Everyone and their mother right now knows how desperate the Buffalo Bills are for a wide receiver. So to me, it's awfully convenient that all of a sudden, we're hearing about the idea that the Bills are fine at 28 or potentially moving down. Seems a little convenient to me. Seems a little, let's put this out there, make it seem like the obvious isn't as obvious as it seems. I'm getting that type of vibe from it. 
And like I said, Jordan Reed could be absolutely spot on here and the Bills wind up staying at 28 or moving down and the rest is history. But I just think it's way too obvious what the Buffalo Bills have to do. And I think there's there's degrees of inevitability. Sometimes something's so inevitable that it doesn't wind up happening. Like it's so locked in that it just doesn't wind up happening. But other times, something is so obvious, it's so straightforward, it's such the easy answer, it's such the right answer, it's the only thing that can possibly occur. And I don't think that that answer is letting the board fall to you. Now, if they get to 28, I'll tell you this. I want to trade back. As I was asking you earlier, if we get around, you know, pick 20-ish or whatever, and the Bills haven't made a move yet, sign me up for moving back. Because I think the talent gap between the late first round and the second round at the wide receiver position isn't all that crazy. And if you have the ability to double dip in round two, or maybe get a two and a three, if you have the ability to trade 28, get additional picks for this year, and then utilize them at the wide receiver position, I think that that's more valuable than taking a waiver on a guy at 28 and having that be the end-all, be-all. Because I don't think the talent level is that much different between where they're at at 28 and where they could potentially be picking in round two if they were able to acquire assets in order to do that this year. Then you can go and get multiple guys in round two, have multiple chances for one of those guys to be the, the next great, or both of them pan out, and you're cooking with gas. To me, though, at the end of the day, it seems all but inevitable a trade is going to be made. I will say I, I, I'm at that point now where I would be stunned to some degree. There would be a significant level of shock for me if the Bills just sat at 28. I just, my crystal ball, my gut feeling, my wager on the table is a trade is going to be made. Whether that's up, all the way up, marginally up or backwards, a move's getting made here. There's way too much on the line for the Buffalo Bills to me to just let the board fall where it falls and then take what's there. And I have to think that there's a broader strategy involved here for Brandon Bean than just allowing the draft board to get to 28 with the players uh, on the board, you know, what left to his devices. I have to think there's a broader strategy here. When you move off of your wide receiver one without a, a bona fide wide receiver two at this point, because you did move off of what was your wide receiver two a month prior to moving off your wide receiver one. When you've done this, in addition to all the other pieces that have left the Buffalo Bills in this offseason, when you've done this, I don't know if you have the luxury to just let things fall where they fall and take what's there. I don't think you do. It doesn't seem like it's set up for that type of moment this year. Doesn't it just seem like it is set up for some sort of move? I have got to think over at One Bills Drive right now, Brandon Bean has got a broader strategy than staying at 28. Whether that's moving up or moving down, I can't think the strategy right now on the whiteboard inside of One Bills Drive is staying at 28. We'll take the receiver that's there that we find to be the best. Real quick, I'm just noticing in the in the comment section here, the spam comments tonight are just off the charts. I apologize. It won't let me, the ones coming from Facebook, it will not let me mute them or ban them. But this is like off the charts nuts. I've never seen this many spam comments. So I apologize. I'm sifting through the real comments right now trying to get your guys' thoughts. But there is like an infinite amount of Facebook comments that are just saying the most random things. Just random emojis or just random comments that have nothing to do with anything. This keeps happening on Twitter all the time, too. You notice? You go in the comment section of Twitter, and it's the most unrelated shit you've ever seen to the topic of the, of the tweet. The, 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 the AI bots, the, the data harvesting accounts, is getting it's just getting unbearable. 
Charles is coming in saying, everyone knows the best plan is to tell everyone your strategy heading into the draft. I mean, that's why I read that Jordan uh, Reed piece, and, you know, part of me says, okay, there is a significant amount of talent later on in the draft in the wide receiver. In, in, in round one, there's like seven or eight projected wide, wide receivers in round one. Not all of them are going to the top 15. So there's something maybe to it. Or moving back, there's a ton of assets in the second round, third round as well. So maybe there's something to what he had, what he said. But like Charles is saying, like I said a little bit earlier, it seems a little bit convenient to me that all of a sudden it comes out, eh. We know you know we don't have, we know you know that right now if the season started tomorrow, Curtis Samuel would be our wide receiver. When we know you're aware of this, but with that knowledge in mind, we're more than fine chilling at 28 and seeing what wide receiver comes to us and we'll run with it from there. Just seems a little too convenient to me. And I mean, say it to yourself out loud like I just did. Do you see the Bills staying at 28 to draft their, their, their successor at wide receiver one, their future at the position? To me, it just seems a little, I, I don't know, it seems, it seems a little foolish. And it seems awfully, awfully, awfully risky. The draft in itself is one gigantic gamble. We all know this. I say it all the time. One gigantic gamble, one gigantic spin of the roulette wheel after one gigantic spin of the roulette wheel. But this is, I mean, this is basically taking the, ru the roulette wheel. How many numbers are on a, a wheel? Uh, 37, is it? This is like doing that to me would be like taking that wheel and adding 20 more numbers to it and then picking one specific number and putting all your money on that you're significantly widening the risk, in my opinion. Now, that same argument could be made for moving up because you're adding more risk, uh, you know, based on what you're doing to make your draft pick. You're adding more money. But if we're talking about it in terms of a gambling analogy, say, for example, you, the UConn Huskies the other night wins their uh, second NCAA basketball title in as many years, right? Back-to-back -back champions. They were, what, seven-point favorites? But if you wanted to bet on them just to win the game, it was like minus 400. So you have to, in order to win $100, you have to bet 400. You have to put down much more money to win $100 as opposed to what you would have had to have put down on Purdue to win $100. Purdue is like plus 300 something, meaning you only have to put down $30 to win $100. That's how I see it. You have to put down way more money to go up and get what should be a lock as far as an upper end talent is concerned at the wide receiver position. You have to put down way more money, but the odds of that guy being the answer that you're looking for are significantly higher, right? Just like with UConn. You have to put down way more money in order to win 100 bucks, but it's much more likely that they're going to win. And what ended up happening? They won by 15 points. They haven't lost a tournament game, obviously, in two years. Not only that, they've won every single game the last two tournaments by 13 points or more in an unprecedented run for the UConn Huskies. But there's a reason you have to bet so much to win 100 bucks because they're that good. And it's pretty much that inevitable that they're going to win. So you put down more money to have the safer chance of making that money back. The Bills would have to put down way more draft capital, way more assets with a safer chance of landing an absolute need at the position and a guy that not only has to be the, the guy, but has to be a top end guy. Now, if you stay at 28, to me, that's more like betting on Purdue. Purdue's a great team. Zach Eady, back to back player of the year, right? Probably the best player in the entire tournament. They definitely had a chance to win. They were easily the second best team in this tournament. They could have won the game. 
So you bet 30 bucks on him to win 100. When you get to 28 for the Bills, there's plenty of guys that are around that area, right? Plenty of guys. But the odds of them being that guaranteed win, that guaranteed lock, a lot less. Sure, they could be. Very well could be. But not nearly as likely as it would be moving all the way up. So, I'd much rather in this, in this circumstance go on the more sure thing type side. Because like I was saying at the top of the show, when you are fully ro- loaded as a roster, that's when you're able to be a bit more risky with your decision-making in the draft. You get to be a bit more creative, and you get to take chances on guys maybe you wouldn't otherwise. They don't have that luxury this year. The Bills need the safe, right answer right now. And they haven't done that. Josh Allen has never played with a first-round wide receiver. And I cannot think of a better time to give him one than in the year where you just removed his top two guys. If they're not going to do it now, when, if ever, are they going to do it? It's never been set up better. Now, let's talk about that idea of moving up. The way I think it goes, I think that the Bills move up, but not as far up as it would take to get a Neighbors or an Odunze. Now, I'm on record. I would love it. I have no problem mortgaging a bit of the future for one of those guys because I think that those guys are going to be extraordinary talents in this league. I do. And I think that if you're able to obtain one of those, it's worth the co- the cost of admission. It's worth giving up maybe a, f- a future first round. Because if that guy ends up being Stefan Diggs or better, no one's going to give a damn. However many years down the line, or if the, if that, I mean, no one, shit, no one's going to give a, a damn three months into the season, if it winds up looking like that. You know, say we get to around early December in the season and whoever the Bills went up and got in the top 10 ends up dominating. No one's going to be sitting there saying, man, I can't believe we gave up next year's first round for this. You're going to be sitting there saying, you know, one, looks like moving off of Stephon Diggs wasn't as big of a deal as everybody made it out to be. Two, this guy's the real deal. He's the future. Not only do I think he could be a a Stephon Diggs type player in the future or better, but we're paying him on a rookie deal and we have him at the very least for the next four or five years. No one's going to be sitting there saying, oh, I can't believe what we gave up for him. But the guy has to be that guy. If he's a mid-tier guy, you're screwed. Right? I mean, that's that's back to to the UConn analogy. Very likely UConn wins, but they could lose. And if they do lose, you lose way more. You bet 400 to win 100. You lose that 400 now if you lost. If that guy doesn't end up hitting, not only are you still out of a wide receiver one, you're out of future draft capital. So obviously still very much a risk. It all is. It all is. But I don't know if the Bills currently have either what it would take to get up there or a team in place to be able to work with them to get there. There's plenty of teams I feel like who might want to move up. And I'm wondering if the bills have what it takes to compete on an offer standpoint to outmatch whoever say the Chicago bears or whoever else are dealing with. So I don't know if I see that happening. I'd love it. And like I said, I'm on record being all over it if they wind up doing it. Well, you, you won't find anybody more stoked. The Bills wind up going all the way up to the top and getting one of these guys. But one, it's not in Brandon Bean's nature. We haven't seen it. And until we see it, tough to think that it's something that uh, is up his is in his wheelhouse. I mean, we haven't seen it done before with him. So until we see it, 
tough to just sit here and say, yep, they're going up to the top 10. I guarantee it. Um, plus all the other factors that I just mentioned, you have to have so much go right. You have to have the team willing to trade with you and you have to have the right amount of, of assets at your disposal to give to that team. And they have to be willing to agree to that type of move. So for all those reasons, less likely than maybe others are thinking to happen. I do think that they end up trading anywhere between the mid teens and the early twenties to get wh whichever wide receiver they have their eyes on the most at that spot. That to me seems like the most, I don't want to say logical because it, I mean, at this point, I, I don't know what the most logical move is, but it seems the most likely I'd say. That, to me, seemed like the most likely outcome. If you were to ask me what I think the most likely outcome would be for the Bills, it would be that. Because we've seen Brandon Bean move up marginally time and time again. But there's people out there that are adamant on the idea of the Bills moving all the way up to the top 10. One of them was on the Up and Adams podcast with Kay Adams today. It's uh, Ben Solik of The Ringer. He was on the Kay Adams show earlier today, and he is one of those uh, analysts with the mindset that the Buffalo Bills are going to make a major move, crack inside the top 10, and get their wide receiver of the future. So we'll play that clip right now. Here is Ben Solik of The Ringer on the K. Adams show earlier today talking about the Buffalo Bills and the potential of moving all the way up in the draft to get one of those top three wide receivers on the board. Well, you brought up those bills. Wouldn't that be surprised to see the bills make the huge trade up for the wide receiver? I do think that they are going to, if, again, if you get one of those top three falling and it's expected to be Roman Dunze, that wide receiver out of yeah. Washington, he starts to get the eight. He starts to get the nine. He starts to get the 10. I brought Brandon Bean's going to be on the phone and he's going to be trying to make an, an enormous move up. They, they, you move on from Stephon Diggs because the money is big and because yeah. there's been some locker room issues, what have you. You can't, you cannot walk into next season throwing the ball to Curtis Samuel and Matt Collins. Can't do it. I like a Khalil Shakir, but the, we, we need a wide receiver one in Buffalo if we are going to be the scary team that we've been over the last several years. And so I tell you, if, if one of those top three receivers are falling, don't be surprised if the Bills make as big of a round one trade as we've seen in the last few so years. So Rome falls and they grab mm -hmm. Rome at the end. What do they pick? 28? That, that yeah. Uh, I want to say, the, yeah, I think they're at 28 right 28. now. 28. They're, they're yeah. at 28. And if they, they trade up to get him, is that, does that, is that sexy? Are we then like, okay, uh, Bills, we're right back in it. Rome uh, Adunze is the number one wide receiver for Josh Allen. I love the way she posed that question, by the way. That was like, is that sexy? I got to start using that. I like that. I will own. Well, and maybe I shouldn't use that. I don't know if it'll sound as good if I, if I say it, but I liked it. Own a Rome Adunze Offensive Rookie of the Year ticket within five minutes of the trade. Without absolute, it's so freaking sexy. Rome is so Whoa! good. And the thing about, the thing about Rome. The thing about Rome is that he's steady. He's reliable, right? That Bill's offense, what was the issue? It's mercurial. It's volatile. It's <laughs> 40 go. points one week and then three intercepts next week. Rome is Eddie steady. He's so good. I would love a Rome. Okay. It'd be so fun. McDermott, let's go. Move it on up. Let's ben and I share a lot of similar ideas, although he is way in. He just said, if you didn't hear him, that he will own a Roma Dunze Offensive Rookie of the Year gambling ticket within five minutes of the Bills drafting him, should they? I love the sound of that. Him and I are very aligned. I think Roma Dunze might be the best overall wide receiver in this draft. I think he might be better than Marvin Harrison when it's all said and done. I absolutely ro love Romo Dun uh, Dunze. Marvin Harrison Jr. is not even going to be a topic of conversation for the Bills. He should be long gone by the time they could even wind up moving up to an area in which one of these receivers could go to them. So it's not even worth talking about. But I think Roma Dunze might be the best talent in this draft at the wide receiver position. I watched nearly every Washington game, and he was one of my most favorite players in all of college football to watch. He's got a little bit of everything that you would want out of a wide receiver, and he has all the makings of an absolute stud wide receiver one who is going to be the face of that position for this team for the foreseeable future. And I, I agree with a lot of what he says, not only in regard to Romo Dunze, the player, and how good he thinks he could be. But I understand all of the reasonings he supplies here as far as why he thinks this move could be made. Let's go back to the beginning here a little bit where he talks about the reasoning 
behind the idea of the Bills moving up and why it would meet, uh, be a logical decision for Brandon Bean. Again, if you get one of those top three falling and it's expected to be Roman Dunze, that wide receiver out yeah. of Washington, he starts to get the eight, he starts to get the nine, he starts to get the ten. I brought Brandon Bean's going to be on the phone and he's going to be trying to make an, an enormous move up. They, they, You move on from Stephon Diggs because the money is big and because yeah. there's been some locker room issues, what have you. You can't, you cannot walk into next season throwing the ball to Curtis Samuel and Matt Collins. Can't do it. I like a Khalil. Sh see, that's the key to me. This is the key to me. I know I just got through saying I don't see the Bills doing this. And the reason I say that, said that, and I'll say it again. A lot has to happen for the Bills to get in the top 10. Going from 28 to, 10, to inside the top 10 is major, major baller status, major move status. Brandon Bean has not done that in his career, for one. Hasn't really had to. So it's not like it's a discredit to him for not doing it. And you don't see teams just doing it willy-nilly every year. But he doesn't really make major draft trade type moves. To that point, I guess, to counter my own argument, I don't think he's ever been faced with a situation like he's currently faced with right now. I think, like I keep saying, I think he's in the biggest predicament of his career as far as the draft is concerned. I think this is the biggest draft of his career in terms of having to get it right. So maybe that trumps out the fact that he hasn't made a gigantic type move in the draft because he hasn't been faced with the uh, situation in which it needs to potentially happen. But the thing he said that is needs to be emphasized the most, and I'm sure we're all in agreement with this. You can't walk out there with Curtis Samuel being your wide receiver one in the hopes that Khalil Shakir winds up solidifying himself as the wide receiver two, because I know everybody loves Khalil Shakir. I do too. I love what we saw to Khalil Shakir last year. How could you not? No one was expecting that wound up being way better than we thought. And I think he was the wide receiver two for these bills down the stretch last year. He all, he all, but secured that status. Last year, he was better than Gabe Davis. I don't think it's arguable, no doubt. But we can't put that in ink that he's wide receiver too now and for the foreseeable future. So with that idea in mind, this goes back to the point I was making however many minutes ago. The idea of sitting at 28, hoping that the reason you don't have to trot out week one with Curtis Samuel being your wide receiver one and Khalil Shakir being your wide receiver two is just magically there for you, and it's going to work out. I've never seen the Bills be put in a position where making a massive move up in the draft make this much sense. And I'm all for it. The reason I have a tough time thinking it happens you got to have you got to have the, the the team willing to do it with you and you got to do it for the right price. Brandon Bean's just not going to do it for the hell of it. If the asking price is way higher than expected, he's not going to do it. The other issue is there's other teams that might be willing to answer that asking price and you're out of the bidding war. You have to have a lot go right for you. When you're at 28, it's your pick. You can do whatever you want with it. When you trade down, you are the team that gets to decide to accept that trade or not. This is a whole different ballgame. You have to have multiple things go right for you in order to get that to get this done. Not, not to mention, that receiver has to fall to that position at 9, 10, wherever. The receiver has to get there. A lot has to go right. But you can't tell me that it doesn't make sense. I can't listen to an argument right now to the contrary of the idea of trading up into the top 10 in the first round. The reason I don't see it happening is because of all of the variables that have to click for the Bills to pull it off. Not to mention the well-known knowledge of the desperation the Bills are currently faced with to get it done. When teams know you're desperate, price just went up. If a team knows that eh, we want to move up, but we don't have to, they're probably going to be a little bit more will willing to work with you. But if a team 
knows you have to move up and you are dying to do so, how much is it worth to you? Right? And there's a reason when you're in the airport, a bottle of water costs $10. Why? Well, because I can't go to the nearest Target or Wegmans or 7-Eleven and pick one up for cheaper. I don't have options. I don't have a competing market surrounding me with an infinite amount of choices. I'm stuck in the airport with one convenience shop selling water bottles at 10 bucks a piece. So guess what? If I'm dying of thirst, how much is it worth to you? I got to pay five times the markup to get it. So it makes you wonder if the Bills are trying to make a move like this, do teams sniff it out and say, yeah, we, we know, we know, uh, we know you're offering this, but we know how much you want it. And we're going to have to add this, that, and the third. Maybe that's why the Jordan Reed stuff comes out. Eh, we, we don't need to move up. We're fine at 28. Maybe we'll move back. Starts to make a bit more sense. But to those who are saying, I just don't want to give up that. I don't want to give up the draft capital. I don't want to give up assets. I don't want to mortgage the future. I ask you this, why? Because I'm telling you, if it, the only reason we're going to question it is if it winds up falling flat on its face. Now, could it? Sure. But would you rather take the gamble of a late round pick being the ultimate answer at wide receiver? Or would you rather go and take it by the balls? I want to go and grab it, baby. I want to go and grab it, make sure I'm grabbing the one that I want, and then I'm off to the races with it. I don't want the variables to be determined for me. I want to determine them for myself. So to those who are saying, not worth it, you're not going to be saying that if it winds up being exactly what they went up to go and do. or It winds up being exactly what they anticipated it being. Now you can sit back and say, I told you, I told you, if it doesn't end up panning out. But I'll tell you this, man. In a situation where it was desperately needed, you can't sit and fault the effort. No one's sitting here right now telling you that those top three receivers aren't going to come in and be studs, stars. This happens all the time. For God's sakes, the Bears drafted Mitchell Trubisky before Patrick Mahomes. No one knows. Nobody knows. And if they tell you they know, they're full of shit. Nobody knows. I don't know. You don't know. And the guy's getting paid million, millions of dollars to say that they know. They don't really know. But if you could have as good of a guess as you could possibly have, the guess would be these top three receivers here, yeah, they're going to be studs. The only thing that you can know is that your chances of them being great are significantly higher. And I just think the Bills are in a spot where they have to have a significant chance at landing that guy. So I'm all for moving all the way up. I'm also in the camp of thinking it doesn't happen, but I'm fully in the camp of thinking a move up to some degree is what happens. And that's what makes the anticipation of this upcoming draft so tantalizing. I've been thinking about it a lot recently. I've just been sitting here thinking, thinking, right? What is he going to do? The other thing that kills me too, and I, when, I, when I think about this, I'm like, what is he thinking right now? What is Brandon Bean thinking right now? What's going through his mind? Where's he at? Because ultimately, the fate of this franchise lies in his hands. It's up to him. Where is he at with it? I want to pull up something for you that I think is just absolutely awesome. And it's going to give you a good idea of some of the um, ideology surrounding positional groups and players and whatnot and where they might be taken or how they might be taken. Right now, 
over on BetUS. The draft prop bets are up, and there are some freaking awesome ones on here. And not only are they awesome to bet on, that makes the draft 10 times more fun. I mean, if you if you already think the draft's going to be a ball trying to figure out what the Bills are going to do, imagine putting a little coin on predicting what's going to happen in a variety of different sectors. I mean, they have the amount of ACC players drafted, Big Ten players drafted, Big 12. It's projected right now, of course, that the most players drafted in the first round will be SEC players. That's currently set at nine and a half. I wanted to scroll down and uh, and, and show you the wide receiver prop bets because that, to me, is the most aligned with what the Bills are currently doing. Now, Brian Thomas is a guy that's getting a lot of pub when talked about uh, what the Buffalo Bills might be doing. Brian Thomas is considered one of those guys that the Bills might move up marginally for. Bet US currently has his line set at over 16 and a half, meaning over would be he'd be picked anywhere from 17 afterward, under meaning he'd be picked either 16th or under. It's currently favorited to have him go past pick 16, which would start to get more and more into the Buffalo Bills wheelhouse, which is why Brian Thomas has been linked to the Bills in several trade mock-ups um, that are out there. Because if he goes past 16, or even if he gets to 16, costs a lot less than getting into the top 10, could still potentially be that guy, and probably more of a feasible task than going and getting Odunze, right? So he's currently at over 16 and a half. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a little bit on that actually right now on BetUS. I'm going to throw 50, I'm going to throw 100 bucks on that. Oh, my max wager is 50. I'm going to throw, oh, max win is 50. Okay, I'm going to throw 82.50 on over 16 and a half because to me, that's a fallback plan for me. I think if the Bills continuously go down the draft board and they don't make that major move that we've been talking about all the way up, start keeping your eye on Brian Thomas Jr. to be that mid-tier or maybe a little greater, maybe a little less, depending on how far he falls, tight move. That could be the answer for the Bills at the wide receiver position. I think he does end up getting into this right around this 16 area. It's funny. Every mock draft you seem to look at has a different take on where they see Brian Thomas Jr. going. I've seen several have him near the top 10. I've seen several have him going past 16, getting near the 20s or beyond. So a lot of discrepancy where Brian Thomas Jr. might go, but as a nice fallback plan, a couple bucks on Brian Thomas Jr. to get picked after 16. They got a bunch of different spots here, though. One that's very interesting. Very interesting. Rome Odunze's draft position right now in BetUS is at eight and a half. And the line is very tight. I don't think the Bills have a chance for uh, to get him unless he falls to around nine. I think asking the Bills to go up any higher than that would be a fool's errand. I just don't think it's in the cards. I personally don't think it's in the cards to get up to nine or 10, but it's, it's certainly uh, an idea. And depending on what Bean's willing to do, it's certainly a possibility. I don't think it's a possibility to go up much higher than that. So Odunze would have to be there. And what do you know, right at nine, where I think the Bills could potentially make a move with the Bears to go and do this, is where Odunze is set to either go at or right before eight and a half. Now with my bill's interest in mind, let's throw a couple more bucks on Romo Dunze to go over eight and a half. What can I do 45 bucks over eight and a half. I think it's going to happen right there. I think, I think he goes at nine. Just a question of whether or not the Buffalo bills are the team that get him. As you can see here though, folks, there are a ton of different prop bets that you can use on BetUS and get in on the action with for the draft, and it would make it so much more fun than it's already going to be. I know I'm going to be getting all over a couple of these, as I just did. I'm going to be adding some more. And if you want to, too, link in the description below. As always, 125% sign-up bonus, up to $2,500 on your first three deposits. And not only that, 
If you want to get on these bets with me, especially that Odunze bet, I'm telling you, what could be better than the Bills tra- trading up to get Odunze and you win some, some money on it? I mean, that's a hell of a night right there. You can do so absolutely free. I'm giving away $125 in BetUS free play. Here's how you can get in on it. First, five people to DM me their account on, uh, on Twitter right now. First five people to just send me a screenshot of their BetUS account in my DMs will immediately get a free $25 free play on BetUS. So first five people, just send me a screenshot on Twitter over here at Zbot Tweets. And if you're the first five, 25 free bucks, and you can go nuts throwing it on, uh, on these draft props, which there are a ton of, and there are a lot of fun ones that could have some uh, some links to the Buffalo Bills as well. Quick word from BetUS before we talk about uniforms and the new policy in regard to helmets. And then we'll wrap up shortly after that. Quick word from BetUS. BetUS, America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. BetUS, where the game begins. Actually, before we get to the uh, topic of the helmets, which is far, far more interesting to me than maybe others. I am obsessed with the idea of the alternate uniform, and I feel like I have been massively deprived of that in recent years, watching other teams have all the fun. Before we get into that, though, get to your Super Chats. Tristan Judd coming in. Love the culture the Bills bring to the sport. You and me both, Tristan. Looks like from the profile picture, maybe a Chiefs fan. If so, thanks for stopping by. We'll be interested to see what the Chiefs end up doing in this draft as well. Wide receiver, of course, being linked to them. Not only did they need it to begin with going into the draft, with the status of Rasheed Rice up in the air, with the eight felony charges that he was just um, charged with, with that uh, massive collision in the street racing incident. A lot of questions surrounding the Chiefs wide receiver locker room as well. I'm very interested to see what the Chiefs end up doing. They've been linked to a few wide receivers late in the draft. As well, but uh, Tristan's saying, love the culture the uh, Bills bring to the sport. I've been saying it forever. I think it's one of the best cultures in sports. I know it's taken a couple of hits recently, especially with the dig situation, but I stand by it. I still think the Bills got one of the best things going in the league from an overall aura type standpoint, as the everyone likes to say on, online now. Aura, that's the big word. Zach of all trades, another Zach in the house. Zach of all trades, though, is Z A C K. I'm, I'm Z A C. My mom wanted to, you know, my mom wanted to make it so everybody spelled it wrong forever. But another Zach, nonetheless. Zach of all trades saying, Bada just caught up. JA17 definitely threw it to a wide run, a first round wide receiver. Calvin Benjamin. Oh my God, Zach of all trades. How could I be so foolish? How could I forget that Josh Allen once had the esteemed honor? of throwing the ball to former first-round wide receiver Calvin Benjamin, who was maybe unarguably the top talent Josh Allen was ever surrounded with. Booger Booger McFarland's favorite wide receiver of all time. How the hell could I allow myself to forget that? But that's why we got to keep other Zachs around. You're keeping me honest. You're keeping me uh, well aware of the things that I need to be knowing. Shouldn't be allowing myself to eradicate the memory of Calvin Benjamin being a bill in my brain. I should be remembering it proudly. Appreciate it, Zach. Sonny coming in. With our salary cap uh, woes, can we trade for Higgins? After June, when we get that $10 million from the Tredavious White deal, trade back into the second round. Certainly a possibility. And this is one of the four questions I posed earlier. Will Bean trade up? Will Bean stay put? Will Bean trade back? Or will Bean trade for a veteran wide receiver? And when we say that, T. Higgins, of course, is in the mix. I am a big proponent of the answer to this question being no in all caps for one reason and one reason only. It's not that the Bills couldn't attempt to do it. It's not that the Bills wouldn't want to do it. It's not that the Bills would not certainly benefit from having T. Higgins. I, for the life of me, cannot fathom the idea of the Cincinnati Bengals, who have been in the race with these Bills for the Super Bowl and the AFC title, the last handful of years, I cannot for the life of me imagine their front office saying, hey, we know how desperate you are at the wide receiver position, so why don't you go ahead and take one of our best? 
There's plenty of teams out there who'd be willing to pay for T. Higgins and make a move for him outside of the Bills. It would blow my mind if Cincinnati would be willing to give T. Higgins to the Bills and solve their wide receiver problem for them. To me, it's like a four, it's, it's a four, maybe five team race now with the Houston Texans, but you got the Ravens, the Bengals with Joe Burrow healthy, the Chiefs and the Bills. To me, if I'm the GM of any one of those teams, I am not allowing a player of mine anywhere in the vicinity of the other three. Not a chance. That's why to me, it was, you know, even with Houston, it's outside of that range, but I don't know how long, for how long. Still, one of the more shocking elements of the of the whole thing with Diggs was that he wound up going to Houston because that roster might be one of the league's best right now on paper in regard to young talent. And when you add that veteran presence with Diggs, who can still put up numbers, team's going to be lethal. They're not quite there yet, but they're well on their way. But I just can't for the life of me, Sonny, see, see T. Higgins being a bill for that reason and that reason alone. But certainly could see T. Higgins moved on draft day. Bengals have their work cut out for them. They have yet to pay Jamar Chase, and they need to. And that money is going to be significant. And I don't know how much, if any, is going to be left over for T. Higgins, who clearly wants it, or he wants out. So, balls in their court with the inability, I think, to pay him probably what he's looking for. A move seems awfully likely, just not to the Bills. Richie, Richie Fresh coming in. Saying you can move up or waste Allen's best years. So sexy. And I loved Kay Adams. She's like, just just in like the most nonchalant way. Is that pick sexy? That's like a good way to phrase it. I want I, I want I want uh, someone on draft night to ask Mel Kuyper that. Mel, grade the sexiness level of that pick. Oh, I, I can't do a good Mel Kuyper, but oh, it was the sexiest pick of the draft. Richie's putting it in a good he's putting it in a good way here. You can move up or you can waste down. This is another factor to all the others that I've mentioned tonight. Not only do you need the wide receiver one, not only is your best chance to get that guy early in the draft, not only is the assets given up going to be forgotten if that guy winds up being the answer, all this, all these things, not only all that. Prime Josh Allen ain't going to be prime Josh Allen forever. We got prime Josh Allen. Prime Josh Allen's pretty damn good. Prime Josh Allen's pretty damn great and can be greater and greater and greater with greatness around him. I don't care how great Josh Allen is. You can't tell me he's going to be a little, you can't tell me he's not going to be a little less great with Curtis Samuel at wide receiver one. I think you're lying to yourself if you're telling, if you're telling yourself that, you're lying to yourself. Josh Allen can still be great. The overall product on the field can be a little less great. So this is a great point you're bringing up, Richie. You're in the best years of Josh Allen's career, which inevitably means you are in the best years of this franchise. We know how it looks when a guy like Josh Allen isn't playing quarterback for these, for these bells. We know what that looks like. <laughs> Don't we ever maximize on it. No one's going to give. Two shits. What you give up if Josh Allen ends up turning this guy into one of the league's best. And that's another thing, too. The likelihood of this guy succeeding, Odunze, neighbors, whoever, they're already projecting these guys to succeed no matter where they go. Can't tell me the odds of that don't go up significantly if Josh Allen's the one throwing him the football. So, great point there, Richie. And it's certainly on the mind of Brandon Bean, I would hope. So, I'm not sure if everybody has heard or not, but there was some news that came out this week about the NFL's uniform policy. Now, the, the NFL has been much more lenient recently as they were in uh, compared to what they were in years past. They've done this with a lot of things. They've allowed celebrations now. Um, and they have implemented a variety of different tactics that teams can take advantage of in order to express themselves in a way that we see done by most all other major sports in this country. Most NBA teams have five, six alternate uniforms. Most MLB teams have the same amount. NHL, tons. 
for a long time in the NFL, it was either a, a rare, rare throwback or your standard uniform. Then they ushered in the color rush, and that was the first cool new wave. And then they started to get, in my opinion, really fun and started to put the league in a spot that I was hoping it would get to forever. I mean, we know the NFL was called the no fun league forever for a reason. This made it a lot more fun. You're allowing teams to bring back their old colors, their old helmets, and then implement new ideas as well. I mean, I, I, I love every week seeing the variety, seeing the Kelly greens of the Philadelphia Eagles, one of the best uniforms ever. Absolutely love it. Seeing um, just a wide variety of different color schemes, different helmets. Just to give you an idea of what we saw last year, here's a few of the helmets that were different last year. You had the Jets rocking an all-black helmet from time to time. The Texans with that all red. The Panthers had that all black. I mean, for God's sakes, even the Cowboys, which are essentially the, the my Penn State Nittany Lions of the NFL and that they don't ever change their uniform no matter what, even the Cowboys altered their helmet last year. So these rules have been in place for a while. The team's ability to be able to change the helmet scheme um, and then have jerseys match that. Like, for instance, the Kelly Green uniforms for the Eagles and then the Kelly Green helmet as well with the old school bird logo on it. Um, We've seen this around for quite some time now, but the NFL just expanded on this. The NFL announced just yesterday that teams can now use a third alternate helmet design within this new policy change. So it was only one alteration. Now you can have a third, meaning your primary helmet, one of the alterations, and then a third alteration. This is significant to me because, damn it, the Bills need to do this. I am so sick and tired of sitting on the sidelines waiting for the Bills to get in on the fun with the rest of the rest of the league here. It, honest to God, it pisses me off. I don't vocalize it all that much because there's other things to be concerned about when it comes to the team and the league. And I understand the uniforms try to kind of take a, a, a back seat to that. But I'm sorry, it, it pisses me off. All these other teams are doing it. I mean, I mean this, this red Falcons logo with the old school logo on, I absolutely freaking love it. The orange helmet for the Bears, awesome. Sorry to say it, but the, but the, the, the old school New England Patriots uniforms might be the greatest in league history. They're absolutely freaking phenomenal. And the, and the white helmet with the standing Patriot, it's absolutely off the charts. All of these designs to me are, are killer. They're awesome. Even the Jets implementation of the black is pretty cool to me. All of these have been awesome, and I'm infinitely jealous of all of them. And now teams get to add a third one. The Bills haven't even added a second one. Do it. Do it. It is time. Everyone keeps saying online that they're going to wait until next year, not this upcoming season, but this year after. They're going to wait until then because it's the last year in the stadium, and that'll be the, the nice tribute send up. I don't want to wait. We've been waiting for far too long, and now other teams get to add even more while the Bills haven't added anything. I want to see these jerseys right here, the old school Tasker Kelly Day jerseys. I want to see those jerseys with the red helmets. It would be absolutely awesome. The Bills have not had a jersey alteration or a significant one, at least, since the addition of the red color rush. And the jury's out on that. I mean, it's okay to me. The all reds are okay. In my list of all the Bills uniforms, they're probably towards the bottom. I like the blues and the whites way better. So, yeah, there it, it is. It's last place to me. I mean, it's it, it's different. I don't mind it, but it's in last place to me. I want what everybody else is getting. It's fun. It looks great. It's another. Re I mean, it's another reason to get excited for the games. I don't know about if you're like me, but like when I see that the Eagles are wearing the Kelly greens coming up this week. I'm like, Oh, they're going to mean business this week. In fact, they wore them against the bills in the game. The bills lost in overtime too. I remember thinking, I remember tweeted, I tweeted it out when the Eagles PR team tweeted out that they were going to be wearing those Kelly greens. I remember I just quote tweeted it and said, shit, because there's just something about wearing those uniforms. You get a little extra boost. You get a little extra edge. It's an event. 
And we have been deprived of it, damn it. I'm sick and tired of it. The Bills have got to get on this. New helmet and jerseys to coordinate with it. You can't tell me it wouldn't be awesome. I know there's people out there, I don't want the I hate the red helmets. I hate the red helmets. I don't want to see them. Well, too damn bad. I'm not saying you bring them back permanently. I'm talking a one, one, two, week, three, one, two, three week thing here for big games. You can't tell me it doesn't add to the excitement level if the Bills are hosting the Chiefs on Sunday Night Football and they're pulling out the oldies. I mean, come on. I love everything about it, and it is piss me off more than you know that they haven't gotten involved in on it. And now that the NFL is expanding it, there's no excuse. Do it. And don't wait till the year after this one because there's just no point. It's the last year in the stadium. Who cares? De- de- debut them this year and wear them again next year. It's not going to be some extra special thing because you only wore them the last year in the stadium. Just do it. Yeah, I, I love uh, that mock up. Oh, who, who, I think I think Greg Thompson tweeted it out a cover one the other day. I think I, I think he was the most recent one to tweet it. Someone tweets it out like every month because. It's the, the hardest picture on the internet of Josh Allen. I mean, it is. Uh, every time I see it, I, I just get more and more upset that the Bills haven't made it a reality. Let's see if I can go find this picture. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep, Greg was the one who tweeted it out. I mean, just look at this. It leaves me speechless. It leaves me speechless. That is, it's art. It's art. I mean, look at that. I'm sorry, if you look at that and don't like that, uh, there might be something wrong with you. Might, might need, you, might need, you might need to go get yourself checked out. Because I don't know how the hell you couldn't love that. I mean, look at that. And you can't tell me Bill's hosting the Chiefs Sunday Night Football. They rock these. I mean, you don't think that adds some momentum, some spice, some fun? Hundred percent. Do it. Do it. Another thing I don't get too, by the way, the thing I don't get about it, did they not like money? Did the Bills not like money? Because I promise you, the second that they debut that that get up there, they will list the jerseys online as they do with all the other teams who announce the you know uniform alterations or the helmets you can sell the helmets too as soon as those goes on goes online as soon as they go online i mean those sales numbers are gonna be looking like phone numbers i know i'll buy one within 30 milliseconds of when they go live and i know for a fact of the vast majority of, of bill's fans i know will be doing the same so do they not like money all all signs point to doing it so why the hell aren't they doing it? Money should be the ultimate motivator. It usually is for most everything else. Go make God knows how many million dollars in merch sales. Just an added bonus. I hope they do it. Speaking of hope, I hope you join me tomorrow. Because me and Rico are running it back. Tomorrow at noon, we're doing another Rico and Zbot collab on a Friday. And we'll talk about the uniforms tomorrow as well. I got to get my uh, Rico's thoughts on that. He's not as uniform oriented as I am. I'm sure he's going to have some pushback from me on this. So maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow in regard to a lot of other topics that we'll touch on, including yours. We're taking phone calls again tomorrow. We did it last week uh, on Friday, and it was an absolute blast. We had a ton of you guys call in. We took your calls. We talked shop. We talked about your ideas and your takes, and it was a blast, and we're running it back tomorrow. So same place you're at right now, Buffalo Fanatics YouTube channel, tomorrow, Friday, afternoon, at noon, me and Rico live once again, and we're taking your phone calls. So do not miss it. Make sure to join us then, and I will see you then. Until then, have a great rest of your night, folks. Looking forward to hosting you tomorrow. And until then, again, a lot of events.